Hello, welcome to lesson 4.1, Making Gametes. Uh, we're looking at meiosis and Punnett squares. My name is Laura McGinty. I teach biology at Ballard High School, and it's great to have you back again. To use this video, the first thing that you need to consider is your own personal health and well-being, as well as that of your family. It's important to work at your own pace as you go through this entire lesson, as well as through the unit. When it's possible, find somebody to work with through the activities. Uh, talk to them through text, email, or call them if you can. Share those questions, share those ideas. As you go through, you'll find it helpful to have a notebook or a scrap piece of paper to take notes on, uh, to jot your questions down, uh, and of course, a writing utensil to help you with that as well. If you're going through the PowerPoint, uh, go through the slides one at a time. Take your time to explore the images that are there, as well as any links that might be available. If you do come across something that you don't understand, make a note of the slide number or the timestamp if you're watching the video, and then you can come back to it once you've viewed the entire thing. If you're still confused or you still have questions about it, then reach out to your teacher uh, to ask those questions. You could also ask somebody in your household uh, ask a friend, um, text, call, email, etc. When you are finished, consider sharing what you've learned with somebody. When you have the opportunity to explain your thinking, it really helps retain that information as well as help you make sense of that information. It's a really powerful learning tool. The goals that we have for Lesson 4.1 are threefold. The first goal is to show how gametes are formed during meiosis. The second goal is given the genotype of the parent to be able to predict the possible gametes produced. And the third goal is to use a Punnett square to predict all the possible genotypes and phenotypes in the offspring from those two parents. After meiosis, the gametes are gonna have half the total chromosomes, half the alleles, but the same number of genes. You need to pass on every gene that you have, but only one copy of each gene, which means one allele. So this is really important to make sure that you understand the numbers here. The gametes are gonna have half the total chromosomes, half the alleles, but the same number of genes. And remember, a gamete is an egg cell or a sperm cell. Half the chromosomes, half the alleles, same number of genes. So we're gonna look at a modified or a simplified meiosis um, graph here uh, in the gamete formation. Meiosis gives half the gametes one allele and the other half of the gametes the other allele. You can see here, this is an example of like the bioflower uh, example. We have a parent cell that is heterozygous. Remember heterozygous means that it has two different alleles. We have the dominant R here and we have the recessive R. Uh, so this would be for red, this would be for blue. Half of the gametes are gonna get the dominant R. The other half of the gametes you can see here are gonna get the recessive R. So again, half dominant R, half recessive R. There's a worksheet that goes along with this lesson, um, 4.1. It looks like this right here. You can see this sheet right here. Um, complete the front side of the worksheet at this point, just the front side, not the back yet. We'll do that one later. Use what you've learned about meiosis to fill in those steps. A couple of quick clarifiers on what you're doing uh, as you read through the instructions. The first is referencing to figure one, which is the box that gives you the instructions for what genotype you're looking at and the phenotype associated with it. That's the green fur allele, which is represented by the capital G, indicating that it is a dominant allele. And then you have the yellow fur allele, which is the lowercase g, indicating a recessive trait. In the parent cell, which is this first one here, you're going to record what that genotype is. Now to know what it is, that second bullet point says draw the phases of meiosis that a cell with one big G and one little g allele would go through during meiosis. And that'll tell you right there what that genotype is going to be. Remember from the Cherwibble model that you did, the two long chromosomes were the ones that had the G. So you're gonna write your big G and your little G. So big G on one of them, little G on the other. These two small ones are separate chromosomes. So you're not gonna write the Gs on those. 
just leave those blank, but make sure as you are doing this that you are carrying them through the meiosis model because they are still in that cell. So you wanna make sure that you do represent them. Give yourself a moment to look over the sheet, complete the boxes with the chromosomes, uh, and then finish up with your genotypes at the base. Pause the video at this point so you can complete that front side of the sheet. We're gonna go over the responses here in just a moment. Okay, looking at the opportunity to check our work, you can see here, uh, as instructed, we did the we wrote the big G, which is the dominant allele for green fur on this chromosome, and then the uh, lowercase g, which is the allele for the recessive trait on this chromosome, which gives us a heterozygous genotype of big G, little g. In this process, we have DNA replication occurs, which is why we draw this little X pattern. You can see here we have replicated the big G and big G, and this chromosome here is replicated little g, little g. And again, we've brought our little chromosomes down because they are part of the process, even though we're not tracking any genes on them. Now a note to make is that we're not representing crossing over, which is a way that we get one of our very, one of the possible ways that we get variation in traits. If there was a crossing over that we were representing, we would see that uh, the chromosomes essentially kind of bump up against each other and genes swap. In a nutshell, that's what occurs. So with that swap, you would get uh, a dominant and a recessive because that's the genotype that we started with. And then we have the recessive and dominant. That's what the crossover would look like. We didn't get a crossover, so we're just gonna go with an exact replication here. So that's during prophase. We have the uh, replication that's happened uh, just before that. You've got your uh, big two big Gs, two little Gs, and the two small chromosomes. We get to metaphase one, uh, and meta means middle. Right, so it's lining up on the middle section. You can see the large chromosome um, that is the two big Gs and the small one, then the small uh, small G chromosomes, and then the really small chromosome that's tagging along. We've lined them up on the middle, ready to pull them apart so that we can form these two separate ones. We've skipped a uh, step, a couple of steps in here to show metaphase two. Again, the chromosomes have lined up. Uh, on that middle uh, plate, and they're ready to be pulled apart again to form two separate cells for this one, and then two separate cells for this one. So our gametes, this cell then has shown the big two big Gs, and then we have these two gametes here have the little Gs. So we started off with a single parent cell up here of a big G, little G. They made copies, and then through a process of division of meiosis, we end up with uh, four gametes total, two big Gs, two little Gs. In other words, two dominant and two recessive alleles. So let's look at the possible combinations of the sperm and egg. Again, following along with the bioflower example that you've seen previously, you have uh, the mother uh, or maternal cell here, which is heterozygous. You have the paternal or the father cell here, uh, which is also heterozygous. A couple of things that we want to point out. You can see that the alleles are marked on the two chrom on the chromosomes. You can also see that the proteins are present as well, nucleus and then the outer cell. One of the things that the mother can contribute is the dominant allele R, or the dominant gene R, uh, and then father can also contribute those two, uh, that dominant R as well. That then would form an offspring that has homozygous dominant trait, two big R's. So the mother then contributes another, uh, or could contribute an R, uh, dominant R. The father could contribute a recessive R. When that offspring is formed, they would have a heterozygous genotype, big R, little r. The mother could contribute the lowercase r, um, the recessive r. The father could contribute a dominant allele r, which would form also a heterozygous offspring. The last possibility that we see here is going to be the two recessive r's. When they form together, they're going to form an offspring of the homozygous recessive 
trait, so the two little r's. So those are the possible combinations of sperm and eggs of these particular uh, two parent cells. But we want to look at the combinations of the phenotypes. In order to do this, we have to understand what we have going on in here. We see that we have a blue pigment molecule that with a functional protein then produces through a chemical reaction a red pigment molecule. Down here we see an example of a non-functional molecule. So if the protein molecule is not functioning, that blue pigment cannot turn into the red pigment molecule through that chemical reaction. So we see here in this cell we have two functional molecules because we have two of the uh, dominant alleles. That means that this particular uh, offspring would be red in color. Now the two heterozygous ones, if you remember, dominant allele means that only one needs to be present. So you can see in each of these there is a functional protein. There's also a non-functional protein, but because that functional is still there, that means that we are still able to produce that red pigment molecule through that chemical reaction. However, in our last example uh, or possible offspring here, we have homozygous recessive. We have two non-functional proteins, which means that we are not able to do that chemical reaction that changes the blue pigment to the red pigment. So that means that our flower will remain blue. So we're going to have three uh, out of four chances of an offspring that is red, one out of four chances that the offspring might be blue. So let's look at this in the form of a chart. These are called egg sperm charts or Punnett squares, and this will help us organize all the possible offspring combinations from two parents. The way we're going to set this up is that the, um, the father would be represented up here. You'd have the maternal uh, genotype represented over here. We would take the gametes, the big R, little r, big R, little r, and put them in these spaces. However, it's a lot of work to draw the model cells, so we would actually replace those with the letters that we use for those genotypes or for those alleles. To figure out what the possible combinations are within the Punnett square, we would take this first dominant allele and we would copy it over here. We would take the father's dominant allele and copy it over here, which would give us our first possible offspring, which is homozygous dominant. Moving on to the next one, we'll take this dominant allele from mom, put it over here. We would take the recessive allele from dad, put it over here. Uh, so we have a heterozygous uh, possibility here. And you saw the other one pop up um, right here that shows the dominant R came down from the dad's gamete, the recessive R from mom's gamete, which then uh, produces this heterozygous offspring. Lastly, the homozygous recessive. So we have the little r from the father cell, the little r from mom cell to produce the homozygous recessive. These charts give the probability of the offspring, uh, of the genotypes and the phenotypes possible from these two uh, parents. So the probability is the percentage of the outcome uh, or what is the eventuality that could happen. So for genotypes, remember we're going to look at the alleles for genotypes first. There is a 25% chance that the offspring of these two heterozygous parents could have homozygous dominant trait. We can see here that this, there's one out of four. So one out of four is 0.25. Multiply that by 100 uh, for the percentage. That gives us 25%. When we look for the heterozygous probability, we can see that it's 50%, so two out of four times um, that this could happen. And then the last one here is the recessive trait, one out of four times, that's 25% um, of the times that it could potentially be recessive or a blue flower. When we look at the phenotype probabilities, it's gonna be a little bit different because if you remember, again, it only takes one allele for um, uh, the dominant trait to be uh, prevalent or seen. So when we have this one here, we have two of them, but these two we have the heterozygous. There's one dominant allele, which means it's also going to be red. So three out of four possibilities of that flower potentially being red or that offspring being red. 
So 75% chance that it'll be red. There's only one out of four chance that it'll be blue, because remember, to be uh, the recessive trait to be present, you need both alleles to be the recessive, uh, so 25% chance of it being blue. So we're gonna take that information and practice it using the backside of that same worksheet, predicting the variation in the offspring. So again, to break this down, you have two parent cells this time, and you're gonna skip a whole lot of steps of meiosis to show what the gametes are. So remember, you draw your chromosomes, the two long ones, the two short ones, in each of these cells. You're gonna have another heterozygous um, parent group. So pa uh, parent one is heterozygous, big G, little g. Parent two is heterozygous, big G, little g. And you're going to use the gametes to create or to complete the Punnett square down here. So just follow the arrows on where to uh, put things in uh, and how to complete the interior of the Punnett square. Once you finish that, calculate uh, the possible genotypes. You can see uh, what the offspring genotypes could be. You're gonna write them down here and then what the phenotypes are gonna be. So what are the possible gene combinations and then what are the possible traits that we're gonna see. Pause the video at this point in time so that you can complete this back side of the sheet. The next thing that we're gonna do is uh, a checking of our work. Looking at the genotype in figure two, the instructions tell us to do a heterozygous uh, big G, little g. So we draw the lo two long chromosomes, two short chromosomes. The genotype is written here. After going through meiosis, we have one long, one short, one long, one short. We have a big G over here, a little g over here. So that means that we have a gamete that has a dominant uh, allele. We have another gamete that has a recessive allele. Because this genotype is also heterozygous, it's going to show the same thing. We bring that down to the Punnett square here where we show the, uh, parent, um, the parent genotype up top and the other parent genotype on the side follow the arrows to find the different uh, genotype combinations uh, written internally here. Looking at the possible offspring genotypes, we can see that there is one homozygous dominant, there are two heterozygous, and one homozygous recessive. If you did the percentages, uh, that would be 25% chance homozygous dominant, 50% chance uh, heterozygous, and a 25% chance homozygous recessive. Looking at the phenotypes that are associated with those, the green fur is the dominant trait. So we see again that the homozygous dominant and the heterozygous uh, both have that dominant allele in there. So they would have green fur, that's three out of four or 75%. The yellow fur, there's only one possibility for that. That's the homozygous recessive two little g's, that's 25% because it's one out of four possibilities. That brings us to the conclusion of lesson 4.1. At this point, you've shown how gametes are formed in meiosis. You've given the genotype of the parent, uh, given the genotype of the parent, you predicted the possible gametes produced. Uh, you also used a Punnett square to predict all the possible genotypes and phenotypes in the offspring from those two parents. Your next step, if you didn't complete the worksheet while you were watching the video uh, or going through the PowerPoint, now's your time to do that. So go ahead and complete the remainder of 4.1, making gametes worksheet. And then finally, try that challenge. It's an optional Punnett square extension that gives you a little bit more complexity with Punnett squares, uh, and it's a really great opportunity to practice. Really, really appreciate your time, your effort, and your energy that you bring to this. Uh, thank you so much for all the work that you do. And I really look forward to our next experience.